Alt R. Okay. So let's take off here. Um, the other day on uh, Monday, I filled out this thing. This was first for light and air incident on a flat surface of glass with a particular index of refraction. And for that, we calculated the uh, angle of refraction for a bunch of different incident angles. And what we found from that is that if light goes, so here's air, here's glass. And if light goes from air into glass, this is the path it would follow if it wasn't bent. But what actually happens in every case is that the light bends toward the normal to the surface. And I didn't draw a very good normal to the surface here. But that's something that happens when light goes from an index with a low index of refraction into one with a high index of refraction. It always bends toward the normal. And then we also did something in the reverse. We had light be in glass and go into air. And we found that it bends toward the normal in that case. And at some particular angle, which uh, I can't remember if I calculated it or not, um, somewhere between 30 degrees and 45 degrees, light stopped exiting the glass and started being completely bent. And that was a, a property called total internal reflection. And if you have the glass here and air here, this time I'll draw an actual good normal to the surface. For any time it's in a high index of refraction material and reflecting off of a lower index of refraction, at some point when the angle of incidence, which again is measured from the normal, so... Uh, and it starts at a certain point called the critical angle, what you'll have instead is total internal reflection, which is uh, it'll bounce off at the incident angle. But uh, let's see, when this angle here reaches a certain point, you'll have 100% total internal reflection. And total internal reflection is used in all sorts of situations. And I completely fouled up the sketch for uh, total internal reflection in binoculars. So I'll show you um, what it looks like. And first, we'll start with a pair of binoculars just sitting here. And uh, these two things are called the barrels of the binocular. And these are the eyepieces. The light comes in this way does some bouncing around in here and exits over here. So the, the light has its path change here. And I didn't draw the, the uh, prisms that that happens in correctly at all. So I'll do that better here. The prisms are actually shaped like this. Uh, let's see. And the incoming light comes like this, comes back here, undergoes total internal reflection. And so it bounces right over here, but over here, it's just matched up with a piece of glass like itself, or this could just be a trapezoid of glass here. But anyway, it comes over here, undergoes total internal reflection again, and then exits. So it's just shifted sideways by a pair of reflections here. And uh, anyway, that's what it does. Or the things can be oriented like this. Um, you can have a second prism that's like this. So the incoming light comes here, undergoes total internal reflection there, comes over here, undergoes total internal reflection, 
comes up here and it's hitting that surface perpendicular, so it's not going to be bent and won't undergo total internal reflection. It comes up here, total internal reflection yet again, comes over here, total internal reflection yet again, and then exits and actually goes through an eyepiece lens. It's got a front lens up here. But it's these four reflections in this case that the combination of that and possibly being inverted when it comes through the big lens in front of the binocular here and the combination of that and whatever happens over here at the eyepiece uh, will produce an upright image that's left, left right correct. And so when you look through binoculars, you see, see things just like you expect them to. That's not the case with telescopes much of the time. An astronomical telescope will turn things upside down. And it turns out for looking at astronomical things, it doesn't matter. If you're looking at Jupiter or Saturn, you don't care if it's right side up or upside down. Or if you're looking at some nebula, uh, you just get used to dealing with that. Um, by the way, a little bit about uh, binoculars. I try to introduce every once in a while a little bit of background information on things. And I don't know, that looks like it's halfway decently in uh, in focus here. Uh, some information on here, BAK4 prisms. That's the material the prisms are made out of. Um, Multi-coated. Uh, we're going to learn about thin film interference when we study interference. And uh, all the surfaces of glass in this thing are coated, sometimes multiple coated. And so uh, that helps in transmitting light through them. And then over here is something that says 10 by 50. And that's the, those are the crucial dimensions or numbers for a pair of binoculars. The 10 is the magnification. So it makes the angular separation between things you're looking at 10 times bigger. Uh, if it's the angular separation between the deer's eyes or something like that, that means they it looks like it's 10 times bigger. So that's the magnification. And then the 50 is the diameter of the big lens in front here measured in millimeters. So these have 50 millimeter diameter um, lenses. And so those are the two. The bigger the diameter of the lenses, the more light they, they gather. It's not so important if you only use them in the daytime, but uh, for looking at astronomical things, I really like using binoculars for astronomy, by the way. Uh, but for looking at astronomical things, the bigger this number here is, the larger the diameter of the objective lens, the more light comes in. And I actually have a pair of binoculars with 100 millimeter diameter objective lenses. They're really heavy. And so um, that's how big the objective lenses are on those binoculars. I've also got some that are 80. I think I've got some 70s and some 63s. Um, as I mentioned, I really like using binoculars. And uh, these ones um, are light to hold by hand. I just keep them handy because we've got critters around our property. And uh, like if there's a moose out there or something, I'll look through the binoculars at it. So, and birds too. But anyway, that's a little bit about binoculars. Okay. Um, the other day we introduced the idea of uh, index is a refraction. It's a measure of how much light is slowed in something and how light is bent when it goes from one medium to another. And we usually treat it as a single number, but it turns out it varies some. And somewhere I tracked down, I don't remember where I got this information, but this is the index of refraction. It's for um, high dispersion crown glass. And I got more complete information than is, than is in a table that I'm going to show you here in a minute. 
but uh, this is the curve of the index of refraction. And it goes, it's not a huge variation, 1.48 down to 1.45, although, um, let's see, visible light is from about 400 to 700 nanometers. So we really don't care about the part past 700 or past 400. So here's visible light in here. It's just in between these things. And this is the violet end of the visible spectrum. And this is the red end of the visible spectrum. So past here would be infrared light. Those are only approximate numbers, by the way. Um, and past here would be ultraviolet. I'm pretty sure <clears throat> I'm pretty sure I can't see light all the way to 400 nanometers. When I was a student at Eastern, we had some labs we did uh, our senior, junior, senior year called advanced labs. And uh, one of the experiments, we were looking at the hydrogen spectrum. And of the five of us doing the experiment, there was only one person who could see this light at... Uh, there was some that was 410 nanometers in wavelength. This is uh, one of the hydrogen spectral lines. And so um, not everybody has things in their eye that are sensitive to that. Although in my case, yeah, it was probably just my eye. I wore, I wore contact lenses in those days. Um, and the 700 is also an approximate number, but we usually just use that. Anyway, uh, a varying index of refraction for light. This is the reason that when you shine white light through a prism, and let's see, let's suppose you have an incoming light ray that comes in here from the left. So here's an incoming light ray. When it enters the glass and the prism, it'll bend toward the normal. And so it'll do that. And when it exits the glass here, it'll bend away from the normal. And so instead of continuing on that path, it'll bend in this direction. So a couple of bends there. But if you've done an experiment with this or seen the light that shines through a prism, you know that you get a rainbow effect over here. And that happens because not or light of every wavelength is not bent by the same amount. And so it's that dispersion that lets you make a rainbow with a prism, or lets you see a rainbow with a prism. So that's something that's uh, going on with all the time. We don't do a whole lot with dispersion, by the way. Oh, did somebody have a question? Or just forget to mute their mic? OK. Um, here's some things. Diff uh, different glasses, and there's a lot of different kinds of glass. There's light flint, heavy flint, heaviest flint glass, uh, high dispersion crown, um, which is, and there it's more than one type of this, so uh, there is that as well. Zinc crown, all sorts of different things are uh, stuck into these, and uh, and different blends of stuff in the glass. So there's borosilicate glass, which is what Pyrex is made of. And that has particular characteristics as well. Okay, but anyway, um, just something that happens with these different things there. Here's a somewhat complicated, well, it is a complicated problem. We have a trapezoidal slab made of high dispersion crown glass. And that's the stuff for which we have the uh, index of refraction graphed on this side. And a light source, which is a tungsten bulb capable of producing all waves of visible light, wavelengths. And it's incident on, on face A down here. Sorry, this isn't blown up very much. And then it goes through the glass and it's like a trapezoid. So this other face where it exits is at an angle to that light. If it was just flat here, the light would go straight on through. And it leaves face B here. That's this face. So 
how wide is the rainbow pattern that you see on the paper 10 meters away from face B? Hmm. Well, I need another piece of paper to draw a nice big diagram of here of this thing. to try and figure out just what's going to happen. And I can ignore all this bottom part and just think about the exiting light. So here's what's happening. We've got, um, basically, we have a 10 degree angle here. And I'm going to exaggerate the angle. Uh, yeah, 10 degree angle and 10 meters away. We've got two tens there. Um, and light is hitting that coming from this direction. Well, if that's a 10 degree angle, that will also be the angle that the light makes with the normal to the surface. And so, okay. And we can figure out the angle that the light now we're going from a high index of refraction into a low index of refraction that means the light will be bent away from the normal and so on exiting here it's going to make a larger than 10 degree angle with this normal here and so we'll be able to to figure that out all right well snell's law N1 sine theta 1, theta 1 is 10 degrees, is going to equal N2 sine theta 2. It's going into air, so here's N2 up here, which is going to be 1.00. N1 is going to vary with the wavelength of the light. So let's do it for 400 nanometer light and see what we get. It's theta 2 that we're going to be after. And if I do the, since N2 is just equal to 1, I'm going to ignore it. And I can say sine of theta 2 will equal N1 sine theta 1. And theta 1 is 10.00 degrees. Or theta 2 will equal whatever, well, inverse sine of N1 sine of 10.00 degrees. So I can figure out what it is for those those two different wavelengths. So let's do the 400 nanometer light. Theta 2 will equal inverse sine of N1 for that 400 nanometer light. Look over here, it's 1.47, and I'd say 1.470, because we can read that graph that accurately. So 1.470, I'll have four significant figures, although let's pretend that we have that many on this. I'll call it 400.0 nanometer light. Um, and actually, we're reading it off that graph. Can we do that well? I don't know. Actually, it's right at that point. So, yeah, close enough to exact, or three sig figs anyway. Okay, uh, well, maybe not four, but, uh, oh, we don't need the wavelength of the light in this equation anyway. Okay, anyway, sine of 10.00 degrees. And what do we get? I got a new version of this calculator, which has more readable <laughs> buttons for the uh, order of operations. So inverse sine, whoops, turn calculator on. Whoops, clear that junk. Um, 0.470 sine of... 10.00, and I get 14 point, um, 79 degrees. 
So for the 400 nanometer light, that's how much it's going to be bent by. Let's go ahead and do it for the 700 nanometer. Theta 2 will equal the inverse sine of, for this one, what did I do with that sheet? Good grief. Oh, on the back of this. Uh, 700 nanometer light. I am going to have to estimate this. So, calculator, directions. What did I do with my ruler? Oh, there it is. Threw it on the floor. Okay, I'll try to do this as well as I can. Well, this is 1.46 here, and this is 1.45. So, looks to me like um, about 1.455 or 1. Point, probably 1.456. So, that's what I'll say it is. Let's stick with that. There, and down here. All right. Boy, it's just a messy thing. Anyway. And there will be uncertainty in that last significant figure on whatever we get. So that's understood. So I just go in there and use the same calculation again but change it to five, six. And I get 14.65 degrees. Okay. And now what do I have to figure out? Okay, these total angles, this is theta 2 here, and what I want to do is figure out what those angles are with a straight-ahead direction to this sheet of paper that's 10 meters away from here. Well, let's see. Oh, actually, it'll be the angle with the, not with the normal. If this is 10 degrees, this is 10 degrees. Oh, yeah. So angle that it makes with this is going to be 10 minus theta 2. So um, the, or the, the uh, violet light. That's the 400 nanometers. The angle it makes with the straight ahead is going to be 4.79 degrees. And for the red, 700 nanometers. The angle it'll make with the straight ahead is 4.65 degrees. So the violet light is bent more than the red light happens to be. And then it's headed out here, and it's going to go to a point that is 10.00 meters away, and we want to know how far apart these things are. So I'm going to draw yet another picture, um, yet another piece of paper. And here's what I'll have um, in every case. This is going to be the 10.00 degrees minus theta 2. This is 10.00 degrees. And I'll just call this x over here. And um, x over 10.00 meters. Oh, that's meters, not degrees. That's helpful, is going to equal the tangent of that 
10.00 degrees minus theta 2. So let's do it. Um, x for the violet is going to equal 10.00 meters times the tangent of for violet minus it's 4.79 degrees. So I'll be down to three significant figures here, but that's going to equal Uh, 0 0.838, which is 83.8 centimeters. That's going to be noticeable. For the red, I just change the number here. Tangent of not 4.79, but 4.65. I get 0 0.813 meters. And the difference between those two, 38 minus 13 is 25. Um, that will be 25 millimeters apart. So width equals X violet minus X red equals 0 0.025 meters or 25 millimeters, which is just about an inch, actually. Uh, an inch is defined to be 25.4 meters. So um, yeah, 25 millimeters is about that wide, how far it is between my fingers there. So this would be visible for sure. So you'd have a, a rainbow over there that's about an inch wide. 10 meters away. So that was a, a dispersion problem anyway. Okay. Um, then it says, now suppose the angle of incidence at face A is varied. At some point, blue or red light may no longer exit from the slab. Um, which direction will the angle of incidence have to be tilted for this to occur? Yikes. That's kind of complicated. Well, here's what's going to happen, though. Um, if you have the light coming in from this direction, it's going to be bent toward the normal. But it'll be coming up here. And for a while, it will be hitting this at closer to a perpendicular angle. But if you have it coming in from this direction, it's going to be going up like this and hitting that up there at a bigger angle. And at some point, stuff isn't going to exit. So you want to move it this way in order to have it uh, have a bigger angle there. And let's see. Which direction will the angle of incidence have to be tilted for this to occur? Okay, I think going in that direction is what's going to make it happen first. And which color will vanish from the sheet of paper first? Well, let's see. Oh, we can figure this out. The critical angle... Um, is the angle for light leaving something. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. We're going into air, so N2 is 1. And what happens at the critical angle is that uh, theta 2 is a 90 degree angle, is the angle of refraction. 
that's when total internal reflection starts happening. So this side, whole side is just equal to one. And N1 sine theta one is gonna equal one or theta one is gonna be the angle for which the sine is one over N1. And let's see. Um, have to stop and think about this. It'll happen at a smaller angle or bigger values of N1, the index of refraction. So I think it's for the violet light that it will occur first because that's the stuff that ended up being bent more um, as it was going through there. So. But we can think about that, but not worry about it too much. I think that may be all I had on a dispersion problem. All kinds of different things do dispersion. Um, lenses, for sure, uh, way back in the oh, early days of the telescope, Galileo gets credit for maybe first using a telescope, but it was actually... Um, invented up in, oh, I don't know what you call this ethnic group, people who are Flemish. <laughs> I don't know if you call them Flims or not, but it's an area of kind of Belgium and France where the telescope was actually first developed. And then Galileo heard a verbal description of it. He'd done a lot of experiments with lenses and he was able to immediately start making telescopes. <clears throat> And the very earliest telescopes were like three power. So these binoculars actually have about three times the magnification of those. But uh, <clears throat> within about 18 months, Galileo was making 30 power telescopes, which is kind of the upper limit for the type of telescopes that he was making. Um, the type of Gal the Galilean telescope has a lens like this at the front, and this is called the objective lens. And then the type he made had a lens like this at the other end. This is usually called the secondary lens or the eyepiece because that's the one you put your eye up to looking in that direction. And the way that you get high magnification out of these things is to make steeper curvature at the eyepiece, but that means you're making this little chunk of glass here thinner and thinner in the middle of it, and it gets harder and harder to make. So he kind of pushed the upper limit for the magnification that you can get with this kind of telescope. Kepler designed a different telescope not well, it's called a Keplerian telescope, and it's got these kinds of lenses at both ends, and you can go much higher in magnification because you've got the fat part of the lens here, and the way the higher the magnification gets, you make this part fatter and fatter. It's harder to make it nicely curved, but uh, but you can anyway. And I don't know where I was going with that, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, with a telescope of this type, you do get chromatic separation of the colors, especially if you're looking at something bright. Um, even with a good quality modern telescope, you can get separation of colors happen. Where I've noticed it most obviously is if I've looked at Venus through a telescope, which is really bright, can be in the night sky, and you see rainbow effects around the edges of whatever image you're looking at. But you see it on other things, too. You'll see a little bit of it with stars. And um, that's just the, the nature of things. However, it can be partly overcome. And one of the ways that it's overcome is for the objective lens. Instead of a single piece of glass, you use a double piece of glass. And the second piece of glass can be a different type and have different wavelengths that it disperses in different amounts. 
And then you can go even farther and have three pieces of glass in your telescope lens, three different types of glass. And uh, if you have two types, they call it, um, oh, shoot, I forget the term. Anyway, it's something to do with telescopes. But you can buy a lot of uh, telescopes nowadays. You'd have an eyepiece down here, which may have eyepieces can have several pieces of glass in them. There are some that have seven or eight actually in their light path. So they can get pretty complex. But this is a way combinations of objective lenses that you can overcome that separation of colors that's caused by dispersion. And so, or we call that dispersion. And it's just differing indices of refraction for different wavelengths of light. Okay, I want to have a little bit of an introduction to image formation here. And um, as I do that, I'm going to introduce you to some uh, terms. And I'll, I'll just show you something here. This is uh, some sign conventions. As we work through this, we're going to have to be thinking about weird stuff like, is the focal length positive or negative? Is the image distance positive or negative? And lots of things on here. In fact, I'm going to switch views here for a second and show you a more blown up version of this so you can actually read this stuff. And then I need to remember to switch back. Um, here we've got sign conventions for mirrors, which are the first things that we're going to be considering as far as optic stuff goes. And for mirrors, there's the front side. That's the side the light is on. And then there's the back side. The light never gets to the back on a mirror because it reflects it. Uh, you can attach a, a mirror, a plain mirror, say, to a concrete wall, and you know darn sure there's not going to be any light going on past that concrete wall. So it's only on the front side that you have anything happening. And we've got these different sign conventions. Now, uh, one convention we're going to use is that the letter S, just plain S, will be the distance from the mirror to the object that is going to have its light reflected from. And if the object is in front of the mirror, we'll call it a real object. Now, for, for real, you can think a real thing is an object from which the light actually does diverge, a real object. Um, you can have a virtual object, that would be if the object is in back of the mirror. Now, how could that possibly be? A little later, we'll be studying situations where we have more than one optical thing in the light path. We might have a lens before the mirror. And so that lens could be forming an image of the original object that is actually in back of the mirror and so the light doesn't ever actually get to that point, but it'll look like it does. So some of this stuff is just sounding bizarre right now. But uh, anyway, here's some sign conventions. And then something else we'll have is S prime. And that will be the distance from the mirror to where the image forms. And S prime will always be the distance from some optical element, either a lens or a mirror or something else. And it'll be the distance from there to where the image forms. Now, if the image is in front of the mirror, we call that a real image. If it's in back of the mirror, it's a virtual image. You have all seen virtual images. If you stand in front of a mirror and look at it, the image you see of yourself appear to be in back of the mirror. And in fact, if it's a plain mirror, which most mirrors you look at are, that image of yourself is as far behind the mirror as you are in front of it. And so that's a virtual image that you're seeing a lot. 
Now, the, the light from your image in a mirror appears to be coming from an, a thing that's behind the mirror. That's a virtual image. It doesn't actually come from back there. It just looks like it does. The light is actually bouncing off of that flat mirror and it never goes behind it. So that's kind of weird. Um, we'll be talking about magnification. Not very interesting for a plane mirror, but uh, for curved mirrors, which we'll soon start considering, it's more interesting. And we have ways of calculating the magnification. That's capital M, by the way. Um, <clears throat> if the image is erect, so it's got the same orientation as the object did, then we call it positive magnification. And if it's negative, it's inverted upside down. And a lot of things make upside down images. That's not a problem. Okay. Um, then we've got these things, F and R. Lowercase f is, I'll talk about what that is. It's called the focal length. And F and R is the radius of curvature of whatever it is that we're looking at. Now, I mentioned the other day that um, telescope mirrors are parabolic in shape. We're going to be sticking with spherical lenses and spherical mirrors for this, but we stay close to the uh, center axis of the thing, and it turns out it doesn't matter if you stay close to the axis, it doesn't matter if it's spherical or parabolic. So we'll have that. Anyway, the radius of curvature of a mirror is positive if the center of curvature is in front of the mirror, and that would be for a concave mirror. And I'll draw these things. Um, it's negative if the center of curvature is in back of the mirror. So we're just going to deal with um, mirrors or now for, and today is, uh, I don't even know if we'll get to a convex or concave mirror, but um, those will just be how those things work. We'll also deal with sign conventions for refracting surfaces, sign conventions, conventions for thin lenses. Now, if we spent a week on every one of these things, a week on mirrors, a week on refracting surfaces, a week on thin lenses, we could do enough problems where you'd have these things memorized, but we're not. We're going to spend a week on all three of them next week, pretty much. And uh, there's no chance for you to memorize. So when we have the test on this unit, I provide you with this sheet. And uh, you don't have to have those things memorized. Uh, next week in lab, we're going to do some ray drawing for mirrors of uh, different types and for uh, lenses. And these are just rules that work when we're doing that. And we're not going to um, use that. I don't think I have any on the homework assignment, but after we've done it in the lab, there's a chance of having a ray drawing problem on the test, but I'm not positive. Anyway, we'll talk about those things. Okay, let's switch our view back to uh, <clears throat> the other thing. So for once, I'm going to remember to return to the visualizer. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, sign conventions for mirror. I want to talk about what F happens to be. It stands for something called the focal length of a mirror or a lens or something like that. And I'm going to draw just a sketch for a lens, maybe. And this is something we'll get to later, but uh, lenses. But I'll show you in practical terms what the focal length means. A lens would have an axis of symmetry and it's just something that goes through the center of the lens 
and the lens is kind of a mirror image of itself above and below this axis of symmetry. And what the focal length is, is if you have parallel light rays that are coming in to the lens, Oops, missed. So they're coming in like this. So those are incoming parallel light rays. They'll converge at a point somewhere beyond the lens. This is a converging lens, so we have that. And the distance here is that focal length. And so in practical terms, it's the distance from the lens to where incoming parallel light rays would converge. And that's what it looks like for a converging lens. Now, for a diverging lens, which is what this kind is, if you have incoming parallel light rays on this thing, so those look parallel, This is actually a diverging lens. What happens to those incoming parallel light rays is they end up taken off in this direction like this. And so they never actually converge. However, if you're on this side of the lens looking back at it, it will look to you as if those lens, those rays of light Whoops, I didn't draw that far enough. It will look to you as if those rays, if you're over here looking at it, so there you are. There's your eyeball. There's your eyebrow. Great drawing. Let's see. Anyway, it'll look to you as if the light diverges from a point over here, and so... In this case, that would be a virtual image, but this would be the focal length of that thing. And in this case, it would have a negative focal length because the light's not actually going to diverge from that point. It just looks like it does. So that's what the focal length It's incoming parallel light rays, and it's how far from where those light rays are to where the image forms. And this is actually where the image will form for a, uh, a lens of this type. You can do the same thing for mirrors. Um, if I have a, in fact, I'll try to remember to set this demonstration up next week. That big blue telescope that's in the corner of the room. Now, this is a mirror, not a lens. And a telescope mirror the big chunk of glass that the thing's made out of is nothing but a support structure for the mirror. And the mirror is on this surface of the mirror. The, the uh, surface is silvered. In this case, it's not silver. It's probably an aluminum oxide mixture that then has a coat over it so it doesn't corrode. But uh, it's on this surface and it's a surface mirror. Most of the mirrors you see have the silvering is put on the back side of the mirror, especially like a bathroom mirror. You've got the glass here and the silvering is over here on the back side of it. And then the, the front of it is glass. So it's got a thickness. And if you take something like a pen and set it on one of those kinds of mirrors, you can see a distance between the tip of the pen and itself Whereas if you did that with a telescope mirror, I've got some samples of uh, front surface mirrors in the, in the lab that I can show you and you can set a pin on it and there's no distance between the tip of the pin and its reflection. Um, they're cheap, I bought them surplus. They're just like, I don't know, less than a buck a piece. But, um, but on a bathroom mirror, if you hold your pin up to it, you'll see a distance between the tip of the pen and its reflection. So that's some. But on a mirror like this, um, if you have incoming parallel light rays,
and incoming. it'll make the light rays converge at a point out here. And this is where the image will be. So this is the focal length. And we'll do it. I'll set it up in the classroom so you can see the reflection of the clock in the mirror. And you would swear there's a clock floating here in space. In fact, if you have a classmate or me put your hand near that clock, it'll look like there's something out here in space that we could just grab. And it's really weird. It's going to be upside down, but that's okay. In fact, maybe I could hang the clock upside down and then it would be right side up. We could do that. All right. Anyway, let's try a, uh, a plane mirror problem first. And this is kind of easy to imagine. We have a sculpture two meters in front of a plane mirror. The photographer stands six or three meters from the plane of the mirror and five meters from the sculpture in a direction parallel to the plane of the mirror. So let's draw a picture here. Um, this could be the plane of the mirror. And two meters from the mirror, we're going to have a sculpture. So, and it doesn't matter really where I have the thing. So anyway, here's the little piece of sculpture. And then I'm going to extend the line for the plane of the mirror out in this direction. And can I get away with it? Almost. We'll pretend. <laughs> okay, the photographer is going to be here, but he's going to be three meters from the plane of the mirror. So one, two, three. So here's the photographer. There's the sculpture. And here's the camera. I'll just call it that. Easier to write than photographer. The camera is there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and this is 5.0 meters here is the distance over to here. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, for what distance should the photographer focus the camera to photograph the image of the sculpture in the mirror. Well, okay, here's the thing. Any light that uh, comes in here and hits the mirror is gonna bounce straight back, but we want some light that's gonna come in there, bounce off the mirror and bounce over to the camera. However, where the image of this sculpture is going to be, is going to be as far behind the mirror as the sculpture is in front of it. So right over here, that's the image of the piece of sculpture. And so that's the direction the photographer is going to have to aim to capture the image of this thing. And... So you'll be capturing light that does that. Now, if I, where that light actually came from, it was light that's going to be coming off of this sculpture, sculpture, and bouncing off there. And if I do a little thing here, the law of reflection is that the law of angle of incidence, theta sub i, is equal to the angle of reflection for reflection. So that's what's going to be going on here. It's going to be coming like this. Now, um, how far should he focus for? Well, uh, let's see. This is five meters. Oh, I didn't label everything. This is 2.0 meters. This is 2.0 meters here. Um, it's this disk they're going to want. Let's see. Oh, the photographer was 3.0 meters away here. 
Here's another 1.0 meters. And we can use the Pythagorean theorem here. We've got a distance of five here, a distance of five here. Huh, I think uh, this distance all the way from here to here that he'll have to focus for is going to equal the square root of 5.0 meters squared plus 5.0 meters squared. It's going to be the square root of 50, which is 5 square roots of 2, which is going to be about, um, hmm. let's see, square root of 2 is 1.414. Looks like 7.07 meters, I think. I don't trust myself. Um, yep, 7.0, 7.1 meters. Good enough. So that's where the image is going to be. Is that a real image or a virtual image? Well, it's virtual. The light doesn't actually diverge from this point. It just looks like it does from this side. So that's a virtual image. Um, let's see. Actually, let's save concave images and all that stuff for Monday. So we've had our first image formation there. Um, Something that uh, an equation that we're going to use next week, starting next week, is one that uh, we'll be using throughout our geometric optics stuff. And you can read about this. This is going to be in chapter 34 already. So are mirrors. We're done with chapter 33 already. Anyway, it's this. This is what one of the equations we're going to have. And just because of the, whoops, this is a plus sign between these. Um, when you have an object distance from something and an image distance from something, one over S plus one over S prime ends up equaling one over F where this is the focal length of what the thing happens to be. Um, for a plane mirror, the uh, focal length ends up being infinity because incoming parallel light rays never meet for a flat mirror. They just bounce straight back and stay parallel. So uh, you end up with an infinite focal length. So this part is zero for a flat mirror and what you end up with in that case is one over S is equal to the negative of one over S prime or um, S prime equals the negative of S. And it's as far away from the plane mirror, the uh, image is as far away from the plane mirror as the object is. But this negative sign on here means that it's on the opposite side and it's a virtual image and that'll um, come out of there. But this is an equation that we'll be using again and again in these things. And then uh, we'll look at some other stuff on Monday to see how to figure out the, the focal length of a sphere or mirror and stuff like that. So, but, um, any questions on here? I've got uh, homework four posted today, and I'm pretty sure I've got the problems in the correct order on the things I put up there. But if I didn't, use the green sheet that I handed out last week in class and uh, use that. <clears throat> and I'll also be posting homework six today, which is going to be on the optic stuff. That'll be due a week from Friday, I think, is what I set it up, or will set it up for. And then I'll also put a lab from yesterday up there. And I may do something where I can show you how to uh, use the Windows SNP tool to take a graph out of Excel and plop it into your lab report. So um, 
Yeah, I might record something where I show you that. So, or maybe do it live. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's uh, that. So I think we're kind of done today. I can stop the recording.